Hello, photography lovers. This is the creative process. It's a separate part of the fashion photography podcast. It's something additional that we do on our YouTube channel called again, the fashion photography podcast. However, if you want to listen to the actual podcast, you should go to photographypodcast.net where you'll be able to find all of our previous episodes. Okay, photographypodcast.net with all of our previous episodes, more than 340 episodes. There you're going to find interviews with different top creatives and also some tips and tricks from me, Virginia. And uh, today we're having a gorgeous guest who is also having an interview with us on the website. So definitely check it out. And today we're going to talk about a particular image of his. So um, yeah, let's wel welcome our guest today. Hello, Tom. Hi, Virginia. Ooh, people can now. Yeah. Oh, okay, I can hear you now. How are I'm you good. today? Not bad, not bad. Yourself? Good, great. Very happy to be here with you and also very happy to be here with the people. So you guys, if you have any questions, ask away in the comment section. Um, today, Tom, you've prepped some gorgeous work for us. Can I show it already? Yep, go right ahead. Okay, so guys, today we're going to take a better look at understanding how this photo was made. So, Tom, do you want to share with us first how the idea came? Was it um, work for a client? Um, this was personal work uh, from a few years ago. Um, my work, you know, I primarily work in sort of sports and fitness, lifestyle stuff. Um, I'm quite lucky that I do a mix of quite lightweight, fast-moving um you know, minimal kit sort of shoots, you know, quite lifestyle reportage shoots. But also uh, I've spent a lot of time in the studio over the years and I do quite like spending lots and lots of time, you know, carefully crafting an image and working to create something that's, that, you know, that obviously takes a lot to be put together and isn't just a snapshot. Um, and the, the main thinking behind this was lots of my stuff is about movement um, and in most cases, you know, the movement is, is obvious. You know, I'm, I'm capturing a, a footballer or I'm, or I'm capturing a dancer or something. But what I particularly love is if there's some way I can create an image that makes you stop and think even for half a second. Um, I mean, I'm sure we're all familiar with the fact that these days, of course, more than any point in history, you know, there are images in the billions and making somebody stop and look is really quite crucial. You know, it's, it's, it, certainly as a professional photographer, it's something you've really got to try and achieve. And one of the ways I often like to do that is to create something that makes you think, oh, what, what's actually happening there? How is that possible? I mean, what, you know, what they call a, a trompe d'oeil in the French, you know, a trick of the eye. And make something that looks a little bit impossible, a little bit different, something that's not just, you know, somebody in, you know, an attractive person in nice clothing, standing in a nice background, which you know, I can do it. We can all <laughs> do it to some extent. Um, so, you know, where this stemmed from was trying to come up with something that, yeah, that looked a slightly impossible. Okay. So this is what you do usually in your photographs. So tell us more about this particular shoot. How did you came up with it? And uh, what did you say to your team back then? Um, the team was relatively small. Uh, the team was myself, um, an assistant, makeup artist, and the subject who is, um, well, now, a few years later, she is an extremely successful um, uh, yoga teacher with an enormous YouTube channel called Kat Meffen. Um, back then, we'd done a couple of jobs together for a women's sports luxe clothing brand um, who she'd modeled for. And what I wanted to try and do was give the impression of her basically walking on and hanging from light itself, not just um, you know, being lit by light, obviously, but actually you know, using light as part of the, the shot and her interacting with the light. And the other crucial part of this is that, although actually these days, a few years later, I am much better at Photoshop uh, in respect of compositing things if I wanted to and creating illusory stuff, 
I've never really liked doing that. I mean, I've been doing photography now for we're approaching 30 years now. Um, and obviously I was trained back in those days that you, you got it right in camera. Um, and I'm sure everybody understands the advantage of doing that. And this was no exception. So of course, once I had the, the general idea of, okay, I want her to be hanging from light or standing on light and light being, you know, interacting with her, how do I do that? And where do I take it from there? Okay, so uh, I can hear myself. Hmm? Okay, it's over. Okay, so now that I'm looking at the image, I'm, I know what's going on behind the scenes because I've seen your photos already, but yeah. it's not the same for the people. So I'm very, very sure that some people right now are like, wait a minute, she's a yoga teacher, but she's jumping with the line. So how did you explain this to your model? What did you say to her? Um, I'm asking you this because probably right now in the, in the audience, there are some people that are wondering how to um, explain to their models a crazy idea that they yeah. have. So how are they, how are they supposed to approach a problem like that? The best thing I found, um, and this the shoot is probably a, a perfect case in point, is if you start with the concept, so in this case, like I've said, I wanted to talk about, you know, actually interacting with light, you know, walking on light, et cetera, because that will get, hopefully, <laughs> will get the subject interested. You know, the, the more, you know, dramatic it sounds, the more dynamic it sounds, hopefully the more interested, interested they will be. And consequently, the more engaged they'll be, the more they'll buy into it and think, oh, this is worth doing. Because obviously some shoots, um, you know, they can, they might end up, in lots of cold water, they might end up uncomfortable for periods of time. There might, yeah, there might be all sorts of reasons why your subjects have to go through, you know, some quite difficult bits, even if it's just holding an uncomfortable pose. So it helps if you get them on board. But then once you've got them on board with the concept, you can then sweeten the pill quite a lot by talking them through. It's okay. I've worked out how to do this, whereby you don't actually have to be holding on to, um, you know lighting and hanging from it and we're not going to break any glass and you're not going to be you know there won't be flames and things so once you then talk them through the technical side which obviously if you've ever worked on say you know either really big um still shoots or on film sets then the bigger the production gets the more these things have to be taken into account you know if you're working with um i've done a lot of work with stunt performers and things and they'll be the first to say to you that what looks wonderfully simple on screen can often have, you know, a dozen or so people behind the camera making sure that when this person throws a punch and the person they hit seems to go flying backwards, actually they're only falling to the floor and there's a mat just out of shot, but it's all set up in a very, very precise way to give the impression that it's real. Um, and part of getting the subject and the, the talent on board is explaining to them how you're going to make the illusion and what they'll have to do. And of course, how they're going to be kept safe and you know as comfortable as possible. So this is an important part to tell them that you are actually going to be safe. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I mean, um, I think, I suppose it's even more prevalent in the current times, um, but nobody, it, it, other than the most sort of extreme of extreme sport athletes, and I've worked with lots of, say, parkour runners who are very, very keen to throw themselves at things, um, they often have to be held back. Uh, most people will have some degree of self-preservation. <laughs> they will have some sense of, uh, I don't want to do that. That's going to hurt, or that could be very dangerous. Um, and needless to say, you know, whatever you're coming up with, whatever you're, you're building or planning, you know, the set has to be safe. And that can be something as simple as making sure you're not outside with a huge, great you know, light modifier and a light stand, but no way of ballasting that light stand so that it can blow over at a moment's notice and kill anybody in its way because you know these things can be very very dangerous i mean i've well i've certainly incurred a few injuries myself as a photographer um and something that i've seen strange enough i've seen it more often when i've been um either working as a photographer alongside a video crew or where i've been unit stills on a film set and things is i've seen directors particularly um i think directors are a bit notorious for this if you watch you know, behind the scenes and, and DVD commentaries, you find that directors are, of course, obs obsessed with the performance and, and how their vision must come on screen. 
And the last thing they think about is the fact that the talent in front of the camera, the actors, the stunt performers, whoever it might be, are freezing their backsides off, let's say, or they're in really uncomfortable positions and they're not very happy. And of course, you know, professionals will put up with that to some extent. They'll go, OK, I've got to do this to get this shot right. But they certainly ever shouldn't ever be in a position where they're actually in physical danger. That's not on. And ultimately, if you're trying to work with these people and get the best out of them, then, of course, having them on side, <laughs> you know, making sure they are warm and comfortable and, you know, and they understand what's going to happen and what everybody's role is, you're almost guaranteed to get a better performance out of them. And you'll often find that then they'll be the ones suggesting other things that, you know, if, if you've suggested in this case a particularly odd pose or something, they'll, they'll, they might say, oh, no, there's a better way I can do this pose. I can... I can hold yeah. this pose better. I can, I can, I can bend more this way. If you just try and dictate to them and say, "Just do this," you may find they don't really want to play along as much. You know that you don't get quite as much take up. You said at the beginning that now you're better at Photoshop. So I was wondering if you had the chance to repeat this photo shoot today, would you do anything in a different way? Um, I probably would because. Um, I know we haven't actually got to the exactly how I made it yet, but yeah. uh, in my logbook where I, I write down my process and I, I sketch out my ideas and then record stuff as I go through the shoot, there are several notes that I've made. One of, one of them, actually, I remember I made a note to take more plate shots um, because back in those days with my limited, you know, I wasn't doing that sort of Photoshop very much. Um, I would often forget to take a plate shot or not bother. And of course, with something like this, having a lovely clean plate shot to work from is so simple to do and so useful. Um, but actually there aren't that many ways I would do this better. I'd probably, if I, if I could do it again, or would do it again, um, I would somehow arrange for more budget. Um, I, cause this was a personal shoot. So it was all coming out of my pocket. And in fact, lots of the, um, lots of the success, if you like, was a happy accident because of some of the stuff that was already at the studio. Um, it's a higher studio, That in fact, yes, this was um, about a month after I shot this. The studio was demolished. Um, it's right in the park. It's right in the park. It's right near Battersea Power Station in London. Um, and then this was just before they started the massive redevelopment around there. Um, and I think I was probably the last person to shoot there, if not you know, one of the one of the last. And I'd been renting it by that point for about 18 years, um, probably on average a couple of times a month. So. Yeah, I knew the guys really well there and it was a lovely place to work. So, yes, I'd forgotten that. This was the last shoot I ever did there. Um, but lots of the technical bits, I say, were almost a happy accident. Mm -hmm. Actually, we have a question from the audience. And Christian, who is always here, and thank you so much for mm -hmm. joining us again, Christian, asks how, um, I'm sorry, does the light itself inspire you to do this shoot? Um, the light itself, in the sense of this particular Uh, sorry, I'm just silencing my phone. Um, this particular light, uh, I mean, do if he means the actual lights in this shot, then um, as we'll soon find out, they are intrinsic to how it works. But light generally, um, yeah, I mean, I'm like most photographers, I'm obsessed, probably unhealthily obsessed um, in the sense that I can very easily find myself plotting out an entire idea for something and then with a, a more mature experience head and I can often stop myself and go, yeah, all you're really doing there, Tom, is creating a big lighting diagram. <laughs> you know, the, the actual photograph doesn't really have anything to it. You're just trying yet another elaborate, complicated, you know, way of lighting something. And, and your, your hope is that when you shoot it, it'll just be outstanding. Well, it'll be really intricately lit, but it might be a really boring photograph. Um, I mean, I've certainly, as I say, my, my work can be quite, Um, fast moving and lightweight and and just natural light, maybe reflector, right down to really elaborate, really technical, complicated stuff. And there's definitely a place for both of them. But one of the consistent things is that, of course, the more complex a shoot gets, the more elements you bring into it. So particularly the more lighting and the more precise the lighting, the more you limit your options with what you're doing. That's um, true. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how how obviously what experience of listening might have had but what i've found is you know I, i love for example creating incredibly intricate um beautifully lit headshots with you know the play of light and shade across people's faces and, and you know very carefully placed highlights and shadows and they can look fantastic but 
if the subject moves by a couple of inches, it completely changes. And yeah. you can't yeah. you can't take that same light setup and then a different subject walks in five minutes later and they're six inches taller because it doesn't fit. It, so there's always this play of, oh, well, it's brilliant and it's amazing and it's perfect, but it's so complex that actually <laughs> it really limits what you can do with it. Um, and this was actually a relatively flexible setup um, within the confines of exactly how we shot it. But yes, light is often a big leader for me. Let's do that. Yeah. Let's find out yep. how it was made. So mm -hmm. I'm going to go back, see what we have here. So yeah, these are straight out the camera. Okay, that's awesome. So I can see that you're changing hair, which I think it's it's really the key. Usually, no, that's why that's how we get this perfect images when we look at all these little details. Because, for example, here she doesn't look that much like she's jumping. Than, yeah. for example, over here also. Yeah. And for some reason, also here, because like if she's jumping up and you're yeah. catching. Yeah, it's still yeah. gonna look that way. So yeah. I mean, the, when, when you when you're creating any sort of illusion, and I mean, you can get into the philosophical weeds here, but photography is always some sort of illusion. Um, it's all got to work. Otherwise, if people can see behind the curtain where the magicians is, they know it's mm -hmm. fake. So True. if, as you say, if if the hair wasn't right on this, it would be screamingly obvious. How I'd actually done it, rather than hopefully tricking people for a few seconds into thinking, "Oh wow, she's actually you know, yeah. hanging off a light." Um, so you do have to pay attention to details. I can see that you're um, adding light, taking yeah. away a light. So what I want to say is that if you're um, if you're guys just listening to this, you can also see mm. the images on our YouTube channel. So it's very important for you to know that the YouTube channel is. Just so simple, the Fashion Photography Podcast. So why did you decide to add and uh, also take away light? Um, I think it's possible we're going back in time. And actually, I started with just the one and then added things in. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, again, uh, going back to something I said a couple of minutes ago, one principle I've definitely learned the hard way um, is that, again, the more complex the setup, the simpler you want to try and add things. And if you, if you throw everything at it all at once, it won't be obvious what each part is doing. So you start with one light and you get that working and then you bring in a second light and see what effect that has. Because if you, if, if you are in the end creating a situation that has perhaps six or seven light sources on it, along with other elements and reflective things or whatever it might be, if you throw them all in it at once and something isn't doing quite what you want, it's almost impossible then to track down well, which which piece of this puzzle isn't working? Whereas if you start with you know one key light, and then you bring in say a second light to fill, or in this case you've got obviously practical light in shot, you have to start with those. That way, it's much much easier to well to, to follow the logic of how you're putting it together. And of course, if you have any problems with it, and it doesn't make sense. You can you know, hopefully take it apart again and go, oh, that's that's where I went wrong. You know, otherwise, it becomes very chaotic. I find. <sighs> Okay, so let's uh, get to your actual setup. So I can see here that these are your props. Am I right? Um, what you, what we're doing there is we've now, um, we've sort of, in a sense, given the game away because you, if, if people haven't already guessed, um, <laughs> this obviously wasn't shot um, the normal way. This was shot top down. Um, so I am, I'm in an overhead gantry up in the studio that's got a hole cut through it. Um, you, the reason it's a bit confusing you're looking at red there is because I also shot an entire set um, with a red color armor paper rather than the blue perspex, which it yeah. didn't work as well. The blue was far more effective. Okay, we're um, on the red one. Come back to that. Yep. So that's so what you're seeing is the camera's view looking straight down from perhaps two and a half meters up in the ceiling. Mm -hmm. um so obviously the camera's then you know locked off on a tripod running tethered to a laptop um and then all you can see through there is just a little bit of the the red background and i think possibly one of the tubes yes that's one of the tubes cutting through that corner so that's actually a hole guys do you get yeah. that at the very beginning i really thought that it's like a piece of of 
fabric or mm. something like that. I wasn't, I wasn't sure, but yeah. then I saw this photo and I was like, yep. Oh my God, you've done quite a lot of work there. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, so that's that obviously gives a much clearer picture of what's happening. Um, obviously, with the exception that this, these behind the scenes shots were taken with the different set, but the principles, of course, exactly the same. Um, mm -hmm. So this also shows how important it is to get things like the hair right and her pose right, because if she's lying on her side, it does all have to work so that it looks like her body's actually you know, under tension and hanging from a light or being supported. Because of course, if you just lie on your side, you'll relax and your body yeah. will flatten in some way and your hair will fall a certain way. Um, even down to how she would grip, say the, the flow tube, she has to actually look like she's properly holding onto them rather than just, you know, relaxed. Um, and that way, when you shoot it from you know, 90 degrees on and top down, you, you hopefully give the impression that it looks like she's actually standing on them. Yeah. So that's, that other one was the view from the floor looking up. And what one thing we're actually seeing. Sorry. Yeah. What the, what the model would see. And one thing to mention there is um, you say, if I could go back and shoot it again, um, I would take more blackout material because the, the blue shots, the, the final, the better shots were mm -hmm. shot with her, were shot with her lying on a sheet of blue perspex, which was, a happy accident because the studio happened to have some there though i'd use white there before because i use white perspex quite a lot with you know, product shots and things and they had a great big sheet of blue perspex and said yep help yourself and of course the reflective nature of it helped much more with the illusion of it appearing as if she was hanging rather than lying on it whereas when she lay on a paper background of course she instantly made impressions on the paper and it was obvious that she was lying on a piece of paper. So the blue perspex worked better, but of course it reflects. And as anybody who's ever shot <laughs> anything that reflects will tell you, that means it picks up all sorts of things. And so of course I was getting these funny catch lights of the sort of, you know, the frame where I was. So the first thing I did was start wrapping every black bit of material I could around, um, around the gantry I was on to try and minimize it. Yeah, you can see little specular highlights picking up on the bottom of those frames. Obviously, a, a little specular highlight like that is two seconds in Photoshop to paint out. But the, the bigger something gets like that, the more you're thinking, God, every single frame I've got to, you know, paint out acres and acres of, of perspex. Um, so that was you know, yet another little thing that I had to deal with was you know, just when I put the perspex in, oh, this looks brilliant. Oh, but I can see half the studio. Ah, right. So, yeah. <laughs> Actually, Christian Zevin, a second question, which is right at the perfect time, actually. Oh. Why do you choose uh, red as a background in the beginning? Initially, because I thought it would have more impact. Um, the fluorescent tubes that she's holding are, um, again, they're, they're almost not a happy accident, but they, they come from a, re a rental house that's quite a small place that I've used for years, just a bloke I know going back a, a long, long time. They're not from a big place like direct lighting and they are kind of um the tubes that go into kino flow so you know they're, they're daylight balanced um and they're you know neutral tone and they're, they're stable and they, they don't pulse to a certain frequency um but they come in sleeves you can add colored gel sleeves to them and initially mm -hmm. uh, my thought was more to do with you know sort of almost fire and energy and so the red sleeves and i thought right the red on the red background that'll be really punchy and of course as I'm sure lots of us have found, you can plan these things out to an enormous degree. And then when you get there on the day, you discover something obvious like, oh, when you lie on a paper background, you make impressions on the paper background. And it's obvious that you're not, <laughs> it's not, you know, it's, it's a background and not you know, the sky or whatever it might be. So I shot with red to start with, but relatively quickly realized, ah, this isn't working. Um, and again, if I'd had more time, if I went back again, I would perhaps try different combinations of colors. You know, if, if I had lots and lots of perspex, you could try all sorts of mixes, you know, the blue with some red tubes or red perspex with yellow. You know, if, as always, if you had lots of time and lots of money, you could go back and do, you know, all sorts of permutations. But yeah, there's an element of me planning it and then thankfully some happy accidents. <laughs> okay, I was wondering, why did you decide to change clothes? Because that's an interesting decision. Um, mostly for 
the simple cleanness of the lines and trying not to have patterns that um, mm -hmm. distracted too much. I mean, obviously, we wanted her outfit to coordinate. That was that was crucial. Um, and I liked the stuff that ended up in those final shots because it had a, a strong sort of graphical geometric pattern um, mm -hmm. that helped with you know, the, the clean, strong lines in the shot. Um, I think one of the ways I've always found with um, visual elements, whether that be you know, styling, whether the models, is if you if you're not quite sure why what your what what why what you've chosen works, imagine what it'd be like if you did the opposite. So in this instance, you know, I didn't necessarily you know go out and style that, that gear. I mean, Cat brought lots of outfits with him. I said those are those are better. But if rather than being a, a more sort of not a zebra stripe, but the, the stripe patterns they are. If they were flowers, for example, it just wouldn't look the same. Um, right. Yeah, if they were just jet black, again, you know, you'd end up with her her skin sort of floating off the background. And if they were too bright, I think it would probably detract too much. So, you know, if, if you ever find yourself thinking, "Oh, is this the right thing to do?" Imagine the opposite of it. And if that sounds awful, you're probably on the right lines because you, yeah, you, know, you may not have the perfect thing, but you might have something that's better than you know the worst option certainly. Yeah, that's a lovely advice, actually. I really, really love it. So let's go back and uh, see even a bigger part of your set. So you've got all these blackouts. Yeah. Which I think it's very, very clever. Well, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> that That is um, that is a, a proper finished setup shot. I think it's the only actual one <laughs> um, in that though that is how the, the final shots were lit. So depending on your definition of key light, um, the key light is either that large parabolic umbrella or the key light is the fluorescent tubes. Um, in my opinion, I prefer to think of a key light as being the light around which you have to base all the rest of your lighting. Um, so it's not necessarily the biggest, it's not necessarily the most powerful, it's the one around which you've got to think about how the other lights react. And because mm -hmm. obviously the, the fluorescent tubes in this case give out a certain color and they only give out a certain amount of light. I felt those were my key because obviously with flashes, I mean, there's uh, four pro photo heads in there. They can, have, sorry, uh, three pro photo heads. They can pump out masses of power. So the power is mm -hmm. not a problem, but if I use them at normal power settings, they'll massively overpower the light that will come out from a relatively weak fluorescent tube. So I, to my mind, I've got to start with the fluorescent tube because of course for this to work, those fluorescent tubes need to be lit and they need to be bright and they need to be giving out light. Otherwise, she's just holding a bar. You know, she just, if, if they're not lit and, and glowing, then the whole thing doesn't really work. So mm -hmm. for me, the key, the key is get the fluorescent tube right. And then basically, the other three lights, um, as you can see, there's a large parabolic. And then in the center at the middle, um, there is a sort of medium softbox with a grid on it. And then on the bottom left-hand side, sort of the left-hand side there, there's a strip softbox with a grid on it. Um, so both of those are obviously relatively diffused lights, but then the grids are there to channel down the light. And the large parabolic is basically just acting as fill to make sure that you know her skin is lit and lit in a flattering way. And then all the two gridded softboxes do is just add a little bit of definition to you know the outlines of her sort of athletic figure so that she doesn't just come across as too soft. You know, they're, they're not supposed to be too bright they're not supposed to be too contrasty they're just there to give a little bit of a, an outline just to lift her off the background because i don't want her to drop away into the first specs because again you 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 know the illusion would be lost a little bit if she just disappeared into the background plus also these this kind of light it's always suitable for athletes and for sports yeah. i feel yeah, yeah. right yeah, okay. yeah I mean, you, you you want to show i mean again having done loads and loads of sports and lifestyle stuff you want to really show definition, you know, you, you, not just to say flatter the person who's trained so hard for so long, but if you've chosen this person and cast this person for this look, there's a good chance that's because you want to show off their, you know, sculpted athletic figure. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the, the poly boards, the polystyrene boards are obviously black facing in because they're not there, apart from the bottom one, which as you can see is white facing in, um, they're not actually there to reflect light. They are you know, black facing to do the opposite. They're there to minimize reflections. Right. Um, so of course, if I, if I had you know, the top three white, what you would see would be lots of white lines in the perspex. 
and the bottom one was white because it helped to lift um you know if you imagine the fall off from that large parabolic at the top right by the time it gets down to her feet there's obviously mm. you know, less light so the, the bottom white is just kicking a bit back in and the other three are helping to minimize reflections so but mm -hmm. I, I think i think that setup was probably arrived at after a couple of hours um you know i, I had a good I had a good idea before i started but then it, it evolved and it evolved and it evolved so I think yeah. this is always very important for uh, for the photographer to stay open minded because if you just start with an idea and you see, especially if you're working with a client, if you see that this idea is not the best possible option, better just as you said, evolve it until you yeah. get into something yeah. really, really meaningful. So yeah. you guys can see right here at the bottom there is supposed to be a model and there is a camera along with Tom, right? Yep. <laughs> So the tube we've got, this is a shot from the other side. Yep. Okay. Um, my mistake. And oh, uh, yeah. Sorry, that, that's not that's not from that shoot at all. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I must have accidentally. Yeah. When I thought, okay, let's just go to the red setup. See, this is what was happening. And uh, this is the final image that we yep. have. Okay. So You've got different poses, different options. Um, I have a question for you. So you said that this was a personal photo shoot. Mm -hmm. Why did you wait to do it with a client? Are there any ideas like that that you just want to keep and you don't want to do it? You don't want to do it for yourself. You just want to do it for a client. Um, what I tend to do these days is... Um, I either in my logbook or I mean I, I use Evernote for just keeping track of things. Um, when I have an idea, I will, I will make a little note of it and then I will add to it as I go along. And in some cases, I, I kind of simply can't wait to get it shot, or I, I just want to get that image shot because I, I, I either know that a client's never going to go for it, or it just seems too good an idea to waste. But what I tend to do now, and I, I've, I've got better at this as the years have passed. Is I'll develop the idea as much as I possibly can. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I will I will think of as many aspects to it as I can account for ahead of time. Yeah, you know, I will think of you know, who the ideal subject would be. I'll think of all the technical sides. I'll think of locations. I'll literally, I'll, I'll get it on a trigger ready to go, mm -hmm. and, and then occasionally, and sadly, it's only occasionally, a client will come along, and they'll be describing a job, and I'll think to myself, yeah, right, hang on, I've got. I've got exactly the thing, and it, you know, it, it might not be a hundred percent fit, but it might be eighty percent. You know, it might be that I can say, look, you know, this is this is what would suit you perfectly. And then, of course, you know, presuming you can send it on to them, they think, yep, great. And a lot of the time, then they will think, oh, this is a much better idea than, than what we had. So, hooray, um, everybody's happy. You know, they get something that's better than they're expecting, and I get to shoot something that I've been planning to for ages. Do you ever have, um, have you ever had a situation when, for example, you've done a project for yourself, it was a personal project, and then a client saw it and they were like, well, we want something just like that? Yep. yep. Um, I've, I've had a few that have been a, a bit like that. Um, there's, if I, I, I'd had another one with some perspex, interestingly, in a studio where I wanted to have light from underneath. So I built a sort of a perspex surface, you know, raised up on apple boxes, and then fired light into the floor and back out again. Um, and I did it with a, a female model, but then it was used again for a fitness client, and you know, we had a, a model doing you know, press ups and things on it, and the light was coming up from underneath. Um, I mean, yeah, we, we tweaked it a little bit, but it was broadly speaking the same approach. Um, and another one I remember quite well, which was what are we about twelve, thirteen years ago? Um, that's quite a, a different kind of approach, but definitely a case of me coming up with something and working it out and then selling it on um through the various magazines and, and sports clients i've had over the years i have photographed lots of events um everything from you know massive things like the london marathon to smaller races and, and local events and things and whilst it's great to get you know that perfect action shot of a, of a runner coming around a corner or a, or a mountain bike going over a jump I was really keen to, to to raise the production level of some of these, and I wanted to basically light these things. But mm -hmm. of course, you've got you've got two problems straight away. One is that it's a live event, so you obviously 
can't sort of, oh, sorry, mate, can you stop and go back and go through there because <laughs> people are you know, competing. Um, and secondly, these events take place over, a, you know, in some cases, a vast area. You know, they'll, they'll cover 10 kilometres, 10 miles, et cetera. So mm-hmm. what I did in about 2007, 2008 was I um, basically created a very lightweight uh, location lighting kit based around uh, flash guns or speed lights as they're known outside the UK we still call them flash guns um, along with radio triggers and optical slaves and things which was compact enough with little fold-up nano stands that I could put you know cameras on and have this gear attached to me I mean it was it was heavy <laughs> don't get me wrong um, yeah. but I could sort of jog with it or I could have it on my bike and I could go around and I could sort of predict where people would do things on a race let's say I could you know, if it's through a forest, there might be a fallen log and you knew, ah, they're going to have to jump over this log. So I could build a, a little mini studio, uh, have it all set up. And I'd be, you know, I'd catch maybe 20 people as they came through. I'd get my gear together again. I'd race off the next location. And I did this a couple of times. And then one of the magazines I worked for said, oh my God, this looks so much better than, you know, the last race shots we did. So they started using me. Then another magazine took it up and another magazine took it up. And I, 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 off the top of my head, I probably did 30 plus, maybe 40 odd shoots at quite big events with this. And I was doing stuff that obviously, you know, the next person wasn't because, you know, there'd be the other guy shooting the event stuff and he's got a long lens and I bring it into our studio. Um, and yeah, that was a nice example of an idea I'd had and then built it up and worked it up and the client going, yep, we'll, we'll have one of those, please. I think this is a great example of how important it is for the photographers to not just be settled in their comfort zone. No. To just always look for something additional. Whether you're it, you're gonna carry like 20 kilos more or you're yep. gonna just, um risk to to look a little bit awkward, yep. to look odd. Uh, because in my opinion, especially when people are starting in the business. And they have, for example, let's say a bigger client or something like that. Mm. They're always wondering whether they whether they look professional enough, and yeah. that that's a that's a funny thing in my opinion. Mm. I mean, if your work was professional enough for the client to come to you, it means that it's all right. You can simply shoot with a phone, but you're yeah. obviously doing it in a good way. So. Yeah. I think it's so cool that you said that you have went to you you went to these locations and you scout it a little bit yep. because yeah. it means that you're you're um you're looking for the new opportunity, which for mm. me is very very important. So tell me whether you are still doing personal projects. Yeah, all the time. Um, in fact, I think the first shoot I did once things eased a little bit a few weeks ago was a personal shoot that I'd had in mind for ages because I was just finalizing it before everything locked down. So it was, you know, Mm -hmm. ready to go. Um, And the one thing that I've, I've definitely got better at in recent years because I was very, very scattergun in my approach. I would be very inconsistent. I would sort of play with this idea for a bit and then abandon it and move on. (laughs) Um, I'm getting much better at, you know, if, if something doesn't fully, work itself out the first time. Okay, what didn't I do right? How can I incorporate that next time? How can I make it better? And when opportunities do come up, so for example, I'm I'm doing a shoot on Friday for somebody I've worked with half a dozen times. Um, and it's it's basically expenses only. You know, I'm not really going to get paid a fee for it. But as a consequence, of course, I'm going to make sure I do some portfolio stuff. And that's going to be in line with what I've just been doing. So I, you know, the ideas I was working on a couple of weeks ago, I'm going to take those a little bit further. Um, because this person on Friday happens to be exactly the right person for that. Um, so it, it's always having that eye on what can I get out of this? I mean, I, you know, professionally going back a long, long way, I've, I've definitely been through phases in my career where either the money's been coming in so regularly or the work's been coming in so regularly that it's easy to become very settled and blasé about things and just, you know, you, you just become a jobbing photographer. You just churn the job out. Okay, client's happy. Yep, fine. Next job, bosh, 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 bosh. And that's fine, except that firstly, situations will change. <laughs> you know, you can absolutely guarantee that that same client um, may not be there next year, six months' time, five years' time. 
either because key personnel will change, because the market will change, because there'll be a global pandemic um, or whatever it might be. Uh, and so you have to be looking for the next thing. You've got to be thinking, OK, where am I next going to you know, what What's the next big move going to be? But also creatively. I mean, I, you know, if you think of and I suspect I'll, this will be familiar to many people. But if you think of what you've probably had to give up or put up with or sacrifice to get any sort of career in photography to do all that and then find yourself just doing basically production line photos where you're just ch turning up and bosh, you think, why have I bothered? <laughs> you know, if all I was going to do was just do mundane, repeatable stuff, I would have carried on working in the factory I was working in when I was 17. Uh, you know, what? <laughs> what's the point of putting all this effort in if I don't then get to come up with ex exciting ideas and find ways of executing them? You know, that's that ought to be what it's about. Exciting ideas, just like the ones that you're showing with us uh, to, uh, to us today. So let's go back to the photo shoot. And uh, I think that very soon we are going to reach the red. I think so. Um, yeah. I, I know. I know. I gave you. A, I know. I gave you a cut down selection, not the entire sort of three hundred image folder. So I know Ooh. they're there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> so how many images you had at the end of this photo shoot? Like images. Um, sure. Do you know what? Give me two seconds to have a quick look, and I'll be. It was probably in the hundreds. Um, this was like I the entire. How many of them yeah. you actually finished? I think f five were my picks. I ended up mm -hmm. with five that I said, "Yep, this is." Um, where are we? Hang on. There's tubes. Uh, oh, no, I don't have everything. No, nope, I've sorry. I don't have it immediately to hand, but it, it was in the region of 250 to 300 actual shots, um, yeah. of which five were, yeah, the hero ones that I fully retouched and went in the portfolio. And what do you, this is the final one. And what do you do with a photo shoot like that afterwards? Because many people don't really know what to do with their personal projects. And they're like, well, am I supposed to offer it to a magazine? Am I supposed to offer it to a client? What am I supposed to do? Um, commercially speaking, I tend not to try and monetize them, I suppose. I, I don't tend to. I mean, I, I, uh, I know obviously you're, you know, many of the listeners will be fashion photographers, and I know that that's, it's quite common to try and offer a story to a magazine and that's often how work is done. Um, I'm definitely more inclined towards the commercial side of things. And the problem with the commercial side is of course, a commercial client isn't going to want images that don't feature their products. If you see what I mean? Yeah. They're obviously, they might think the pictures are great, but unless they're wearing certain clothing or it's a certain person, those images have no commercial benefit to them. Um, yeah. For me, uh, personal work like that is always something that I aim to put in the portfolio and then try and use like you've described, which you use as kind of leverage for future client work. You know, in a perfect world, your portfolio, your your body of work, that's what people buy. You know, the, the, whether they see that via social media or website or actually in person somehow, um, you know, they are buying you as a photographer because that's what you do rather than we need a photographer who can press these buttons. Okay, fine. You know, but there are obviously thousands of people like that and they could find someone like that relatively easily. But if a specific client is looking for a specific thing, then they, you know, you want them to go to find you if you are that specific person. So I've always used personal work in that sense of saying, you know, here is a thing I've made and then hoping, <laughs> I mean, you can do lots to try and increase your odds, of course, in terms of marketing, but, you know, hoping the right person sees it and they've got the right project in mind and, you know, off you go. You're always ready to help, help clients, help people. And I really like that um, Christian have uh, done his work and he's been looking through your social media, blog posts and YouTube. So he says in your blog, blog and YouTube channel, mm -hmm. You publish basic information for people starting with photography. What is your motivation to do so? And do you have any future plans with it? Plans with it? Um, so well, a few years back, well, I've um, even before that, I've been doing teaching stuff for about 17 years, I suppose. Um, and I've done some university lecture tours with Nikon and I've and teaching in person is fantastic fun. Um, I love 
going to universities and, and spending time with them because it's it kind of reminds me why I do it if that makes sense it you know it, it, as I get old and cynical it's quite refreshing to be around people who aren't quite as old and cynical um and then I started writing a blog again about 13 14 years ago because back then um the landscape was very different online there wasn't much learning out there anyway and what learning was out online was very straightforward in terms of this is how you do exposure uh, the landscape is totally different now because of particularly people like Chase Jarvis, but also just the entire change in the you know the online learning landscape. You, know, you can obviously go and take online courses in pretty much everything, even the more esoteric things that I always used to cover, which is creativity and business and that sort of thing, which generally don't get talked about much. Um, but a few years back, uh, in an attempt to basically you know, make some money off the side of these, um, I created more straightforward courses. So just straightforward, you know, the basics of technical photography and lighting and a few other bits. And I hosted them on a site called Teachable, whereby you you, know, you pay to watch a course. Um, and they sat there and they didn't really make very much money um, because basically I kind of missed the boat. You know, if, if I'd done that 10 years ago, who knows? But because I did it at a time when half the world was doing it and half the world had a bigger marketing budget than me, um, they didn't really reap any of the rewards. So instead, what I decided was that having made all the content, <laughs> it was daft to leave it sitting behind a paywall. And so bit by bit, I'm now putting it all up on YouTube, where obviously it's free. Um, and although it's fairly easy to uh, teach straightforward stuff, I suppose, like lighting and the technical side of things, that's not my interest as much as teaching creativity and business and the sort of things we've been talking about, you know, the actual, the bits that you don't tend to get taught at college or the bits that you tend to have to learn yourself the hard way. Um, because having been doing this for so long, I have sadly learned an awful lot of lessons myself the hard way. Um, and if there's ways people can avoid making those mistakes, that would be great for them. Uh, but yeah, there's a, there's a truism of life that you generally tend not to learn these things until you do it yourself. So, yes, I try as I might, I'm sure people will still make the same mistakes. So are we going to see any new content from you on your yeah. YouTube channel? Oh, yeah, okay. um, I've, I've got, there are a couple of other full courses that I've worked out in outline. Um, and I'm, you know, sporadically um, vlogging because I find it a little bit easier than writing a blog now because by the time I've written a the script of a vlog, which is basically a blog post. I may as well just film myself. Um, the catch with that is, as always, it's not directly earning me any money. So I have to fit it in around, you know, actually doing real jobs. Um, and ideally, <laughs> in a perfect world when situations are a bit different, uh, it would be lovely to go back on the road and go to universities a bit more often because that's been talked about again a few times with um some of the you know big clients i work with like nikon a lot i do still teach stuff with nikon um you know sort of individual day workshops and things um but those are obviously at the moment on hold um and we're always looking for new ideas and new ways of doing those we've done things we've done uh parkour courses we've done things in a disused nuclear bunker with stunt performers um and basically if we can think up a daft idea to do that we think people want to pay to come and photograph we'll we'll do it so, yeah, those are sort of future plans. Yeah, that's nice. So we'll be able to check out your channel because I'm going to yeah, link it right up. Yeah. As we Absolutely. So tell me, what was, like, what is it, the biggest lesson that you've had throughout the years? What is the thing that you're just reminding to yourself constantly? I suspect the biggest lesson would probably be one that they tried to drill into us at college and that I struggle with at college. And I probably didn't even really begin to realize I'd been getting wrong until about 14 years ago. Um, so I was at college between 95 and 98, moved to London, assisted, started shooting myself. And in the early days of shooting for myself, I was that photographer I just described five minutes ago where I was just churning things out, you know, bash, 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 you know, take the job, take the money, because, of course, when you are starting out, primarily you are just thinking, oh, my God, pay the bills, pay the bills. And what the college had tried to get us to do um, 
was to was to develop this consistent body of work. And you know, when you'd done a shoot, you looked at it afterwards, and with the help of the tutors, which of course you don't have outside college, um, with their help you would look at what you'd done, and you basically you know match it up with what your initial ideas were and your concept, and you know how well had you done, and try and give yourself some feedback and try and assess it. But the next really important step was you would then say, okay, so if I've done that and it didn't work for these reasons or it, it worked really well, but I want to change this, what do I do next? And then you take the next step and you take the next step and you take the next step and it's an evolution. And what I did at college and for a long time afterwards was I would just scatter. I, I would do this bit and I think I'd got it and I get bored with it and move on to something else. And I'd, I'd sort of play around with that, but not play around with it to the point where I'd really perfected it. I would just, it would be okay. You know, it would be an okay version of that shot. And so I wasn't getting any depth in any areas. I was getting very good at lots and lots of things, but not very deep. And it wasn't until, like I say, about the mid 2000s that I began to realize, God, my work's a bit crap. Um, you know, I'm, I really am just producing the same thing that most people can produce. Um, and bit by bit began to kind of go back to what they tried to get into us at college, which is, you know, you're not going to suddenly create, you know, if you look at this inspiring work by whoever it might be, you're never going to create one of those tomorrow. You know, that, that they created that after, you know, a huge investment of their time, their creative energy, you know, they had teams around them, they would have tried this out and perfected it and perfected it and perfected it. You can't expect just to one day suddenly go, oh, I, I now take pictures like this. It's like, no, you know, it, it takes a while to develop this. And it's, you know, it will be three steps forward, two back. Um, you know, you have to learn the lessons from what you do, but then just not not just learn them, but actually go and act on them. Um, you know, I mean, I've I've been using a logbook, like I described, ever since the start of college. And yet for years, it probably wasn't doing any good because I would just, you know, I, I would put a shoot in and I would make notes at the end and say, oh, you did this wrong. And I go and do it wrong again the next time. You know, it's just absolutely kind of how dim do you have to be? Um, but you know, recently I'm happy to say I've got much better at you know looking at one of those lessons and going. So next time, <laughs> what are we going to do? Right, we're going to do this. And I think that's you know if there's a if there's a, a one single lesson, it's understanding that it's evolution, that it's an, it's a never ending learning process, and that you will you know slip back as well as going forward. But if you keep making the same mistakes again and again and again, then there's something wrong. You, know, you need to be changing your plans if you are making the same mistake over and over again. I love this. Thank you so much. I think uh, this is a good lesson for all of us. And now with you saying this to us, I think that we are all going to make this little but very important step tomorrow. Thank you so much for being with us. No problem. Good to see you. It was lovely to have you, and uh, I'm gonna stick to uh, the followers now, and you'll be able to also see there are some additional questions for you in the comments. So thank you, Tom, sure. and have a great day. Thank you very much. Thanks, Virginia. Bye bye. So, guys, this was an amazing episode. I truly loved it. I hope that you loved it too. It was something different. It was uh, it was a spark of something new. So, I really, really hope that you liked it. And uh, yes, you can continue with your questions down below in the comments, even after this video is over, because we're gonna go over the comments and we're gonna answer your questions. So before the end of um, today's episode, I would like to remind you that you can go to photographypodcast.net and see all of our previous episodes along with Tom, because we've got some episodes with him. And there are some truly cool stuff that we're talking about that I'm sure you're going to enjoy. As you can see, there is also a donate button. So if you want to, and you feel like so, if you feel like you're ready to donate, you are more than welcome to do it. However, if you're not in a position of doing that right now, you can definitely just share this YouTube episode with all of your friends because this is really, really going to help us. The next thing you can do is to, of course, subscribe to the channel, leave your comments down below, leave the thumbs up because Tom and this awesome video really deserves it. And thank you guys so, so much for being with us today because it was lovely to have you. And uh, yeah, 
the podcast is still on. So there will be a new episode this Wednesday. So keep your ears open. Okay. <laughs> See you soon, guys.